Good evening, and a very Merry Christmas to you all. It was Christmas Eve, though, of course, it's a mere matter of information. I'm sure I have no need to tell you that. It is always Christmas Eve in a ghost story. Why all this haunting should take place on Christmas Eve, of all nights in the year, I never could myself understand. At Christmas time, everybody has quite enough to put up with in the way of a house full of living relatives without wanting the ghosts of any dead ones mooning about the place. Still, nothing satisfies us but to hear each other tell authentic anecdotes about spectres. It is a genial festive season, and we therefore love to muse upon graves, dead bodies, murder and blood. For ghost stories to be told on any other evening would be impossible in British society as it is presently regulated. This was the case on the evening of December 24th, 1891, at 47 Laburnum Grove, Tooting, when I was spending Christmas with my Aunt Maria and Uncle John. To set the scene, we had had a very good supper. A very good supper indeed. Unpleasantness has occurred since. Rumours have been put about, and remarks have been passed which have pained me very much. But although injustice, gross injustice, has been done to myself, that shall not deter me from doing justice to others, even to those who have made unfeeling insinuations. I will do justice to Aunt Maria's hot veal pasties and toasted lobsters, followed by her own special make of cheesecakes, <gasps> washed down with Uncle John's own particular old ale. I did justice to them all. Aunt Maria herself could not but admit that. After supper, Uncle brewed some whiskey punch. Oh, I did justice to that also. Uncle John himself said so. He said he was glad to notice that I liked it. We gathered round the piano in the parlour, and after the fortifying draught of the said punch, we were soon in full song. Almighty, and on the twelfth day of Christmas, I heard in front of me twelve pheasants roasted, oh! eleven muffins toasted, ten apples godling, nine ducklings waddling, eight boiled gammons, seven pints seven apples, <laughs> and five of Aunt Maria's excellent mince pies. <laughs> Four pints of stout, three brown trout, two kangaroos, and a partridge to eat for my dear. Oh, 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 I say, I'm sure it should be teas to rhyme with kedgeries, you know. Oh, oh, don't be so pedantic, young man. Oh, 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 oh. Ah, the delights of Christmas Eve in the company of friends and family. The warm glow of 47 Laburnum Grove tooting. Somewhat dimly lit because of the gas strike, but not to worry. Probably just as well, given the state of some of the party. The owner of the Braying Laugh, presently propped up between our curate, Mr Scrubbles, and Mr Samuel Coombs, esteemed county council member, is of course my Aunt Maria. I do not know when I shall care to talk to her again after her comments on my modest appetite. Oh, I must say. Oh, she's starting again. I must say. How about another song? There he goes again, always after more. Aunt Maria. More hot veal pasties, more toasted lobster, oh. more warm cheesecake. Oh, well, yes. don't, don't eating cold cheesecake. <laughs> You'll lose half the flavour. Look, my nephew is a, a gannon. <laughs> 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 well, I see I'm not the only one. Look, the punch bowl has been emptied again. <laughs> and excellent punch it was. <laughs> How about some more? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, excuse me. How rude of me to Not just at all, have... Vicar. Oh, cure it, I mean. Oh, I have a commendable okay. recipe which requires the addition of a little brandy. Uh, that is, if our host... Do not... Come with me and prepare it, Mr. Oh, I say, jolly good Christmas party your family throws old chap. What about another song? Oh, shut up, Teddy. I say. The silly young man is my fiend. Uh, sorry, friend, mm. Teddy Biffles. Quiet, quiet, everybody. Mr Scrubbles is going to entertain us. Uh, um, uh, yes. Don't be well, shy, uh, Vicar. Uh, oh, <laughs> done it again. Uh, <laughs> mark my words, Teddy. Aunt Mariah will be comatose before long. Oh, oh. <laughs> 
Oh, dear, dear lady. Oh, as I thought, oh. out like a light. And don't worry, Mr. Scrubbles. Always happens on Christmas Eve. Teddy, mm. give the curate some support or oh, you'll strain oh. something. Uh, put her in the oh, corner armchair. Yes, yes, that's it. Yes, now, now, now lower her gently. Good. Oh, and, and put the tea towel over her face. Mm. Are you sure? Uh, perhaps we should take our leave. <laughs> no, not a bit of it. And the tea towel is quite the custom for my aunt and uncle. I oh, well. say. Mr. Coombs, brandy punch. Ah. Your aunt's done the usual, has she? And the tea towel. Good. Uh, four more punch for that. Oh, oh good. Good. <laughs> The uh, curate was about to show us some card tricks, sir. Excellent. Yeah. Better fortify ourselves first. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I do believe, yes. Christmas cake and nuts on the table mm. there. Now, <laughs> Mr. Scrubbles. <laughs> ah. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, now, uh, I wonder if you have ever heard of Find the Lady or the Three Card Trick. Mm. Now, it's a very simple trick. What, what a jolly it? time the curate gave us. He warned that this card trick was an artifice which men of few scruples used to swindle fellows out of their money. He said it was a simple trick to do and that he would show us the imposture that we might be warned against it. Now, I place the card so, mm -hmm. and ask you to find the lady. It's the middle one. Yeah. Oh. Ah, you fancy you saw it? I don't fancy anything at all about it. I tell you, it is the middle card. I bet you half a crown it's the middle card. Oh, oh. Ah, there you are. That's just what I was explaining to you. That's the way foolish young fellows are lured on to lose their money. Oh. They don't grasp the idea that it is the quickness of the hand that deceives the eye. Turn <laughs> the cards over. I shall take your half crown, sir, to teach you a useful lesson. Yeah. <laughs> I shall give it to the church blanket fund. Oh, don't you worry about that. But don't you take it out of the blanket fund. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Now. Aha! Oh, dear. Well done, Mr. Coombs. Well spotted, sir. Oh, yeah. Jolly good. Oh, you can, of course, see the outcome of this demonstration. I might only comment that an excess of whiskey punch on Christmas Eve might dull the dexterity of the most accomplished card sharper. The next time, Mr. Coombs put two half crowns on the card nearest the coal scuttle. Sure enough, it was the Queen again. After that, Uncle John had a florin on and he won. Then we all played it, and we all won. Yay! All except the curate, that is. He had a very bad quarter of an hour. Cheer up, Scrubbles. Have some more punch. Oh, <laughs> and our friend here can accompany me in a song. Oh, right. Yeah. A champagne Charlie, my boy. Oh, oh. Go to Charlie. <laughs> I've seen a deal of gaiety throughout this evening great. <laughs> The best of my accomplishments is beating the curate! Oh, well selling is the find the lady game! It's fun to play, and with the pay, I'll buy you all champagne! Oh, champagne Charlie is my name! Champagne drinking is my game Good for any game at night, my boys A Good for any game at night, my boys Champagne Charlie is my name Champagne drinking is my game Good for any game at night, my boys Will come and join me in a spree <laughs> Oh, we did have such fun. <laughs> but the next recollection I have is that we were telling ghost stories to each other. Oh, yes, that was after Uncle had made such a funny mistake and left out the whiskey in the next bowl of punch. <laughs> we did laugh at him, and we made him put in double quantity afterwards as a forfeit. Teddy Biffles told us the first ghost story. I say, this punch has a kick. <laughs> Punch, kick, or to be telling a story about fighting. Oh, <laughs> a bit of atmosphere, if you please, Professor. <laughs> mm. Ooh, 
This story is called Johnson and Emily, or The Faithful Ghost. And it began on a Christmas Eve much like this one when I was little more than a lad. I had been allowed to sit up very late because it was a special night. But at last I was tired and made my way up the dark stairs to my room. As I opened the door to go in, I found myself face to face with Johnson, who was coming out. He passed right through me and uttered a long, low wail of misery as he floated out of the staircase window. I was startled for a moment. I was only a schoolboy at the time and had never seen a ghost before, and a little nervous about going to bed. Then I remembered that it was only sinful people that spirits could do any harm to, and so tucked myself up and went to sleep. In the morning, I told the pater what I had seen. Oh yes, that was old Johnson, he answered. Don't be frightened of that. He lives here. And then he told me the poor thing's history. It seems that Johnson had, in early life, loved the daughter of a former lessee of our house, a very beautiful girl whose name was Emily. Father did not know her other name. Johnson was too poor to marry the girl, so he kissed her goodbye, told her he would soon be back, and went off to Australia to make his fortune. Australia was not then what it is now. Travellers through the bush were few and far between, and even when Johnson caught one, the portable property found upon the body was often hardly of sufficient negotiable value to pay the funeral expenses necessary. So that it took Johnson nearly 20 years to make his fortune. The self-imposed task accomplished at last, having successfully eluded the police, he returned to England, full of hope and joy, to claim his bride. He reached the house to find it silent and deserted. All that the neighbours could tell him was that soon after his own departure, the family had disappeared one foggy night, never to be seen again although the landlord and most of the local tradesmen had made searching inquiries. Poor Johnson, frenzied with grief, sought his love all over the world, but to no avail. After years of fruitless effort, he returned to end his lonely life in the very house where, in happy bygone days, he and his beloved Emily had passed so many blissful hours. He lived there quite alone, wandering about the empty rooms, weeping and calling to his Emily to come back to him. When he died, his ghost still kept the business on. He was there when my father took the house, and the agent knocked ten pounds a year off the rent in consequence. <laughs> After that, we were continually meeting Johnson about the place at all times of the night. We used to walk round him and stand aside to let him pass at first, but as we grew more used to it, we walked straight through. He was a gentle, harmless old ghost, and we all felt very sorry for him. The women folk indeed made quite a pet of him for a while, but as time went on, it grew to be a bit of a bore. You felt sorry for him, but he irritated you. He would sit on the stairs and cry for hours at a stretch. Whenever we woke up in the night, we were sure to hear him pottering about the passages, moaning and sighing and generally making it impossible to go to sleep again. When we had a party on, he would sit outside the drawing room door, sobbing all the time. <laughs> I'm getting sick of the old fool, said the painter one evening. The dad can be very blunt when he's put out, and Johnson had been spoiling a perfectly good game of whist by sitting up the chimney and moaning till nobody knew what were trumps or even what suit had been led. We shall have to get rid of him. Well, said the mater, that, that was the mater, you'll never see the last of him until he's found Emily's grave. That's what he's after. You find Emily's grave and put him onto that and he'll stop there. That's the only thing to do. You mark my words. Well, the idea seemed reasonable, but none of us knew where the grave might be. The governor suggested palming off some other Emily's grave on the poor old thing. 
but they didn't seem to have been an Emily of any sort buried anywhere for miles around. I never came across a neighborhood so utterly destitute of dead Emily. <laughs> In the end, we hit upon faking something up for the old chap. We got the workmen in and fixed up a little mound at the bottom of the orchard with a tombstone over it reading, Sacred to the memory of Emily. Her last words were, Tell Johnson I love him. And it worked a treat. We lured him down there that very night and, well, it was one of the most pathetic things I've ever seen. The way Johnson sprang upon that tombstone and wept. Dad and, and old Squibbins, the gardener, they cried like children when they saw it. Oh, Johnson hasn't troubled us in the house since then. He spends every night sobbing on the grave now and seems quite happy. Oh. There to this day, in fact. I'll take you fellows down and show you next time you come to our Murray's general hours. Ten to two on Saturdays. <laughs> well done, young people. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Most affecting of your good No punch. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sensible suggestion. I'll brew another bowl. Uh, Excellent. Ah! Uh, <laughs> <Excellent. laughs> <laughs> there is a school of jolly dogs I've lately come across. They're a game for any mortal thing from cards to pitch and top. And they always seem so jolly, oh, jolly, oh, jolly, oh. And they always seem so jolly, oh, whatever they may be. They dance, they sing, they dance, ha ha, they laugh, ha ha, they dance, they sing. What jolly dogs are we? Fa la la, 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 fa la la. What jolly dogs are we? A story, actually, is a most interesting story. At this point, Mr. Scrubbles told us a story about the ghost of one of his parishioners. I cannot give you this story. I wish I could, but we none of us could make head nor tail of it. There seemed to be an enormous amount of plot and a great many varied characters. Simply, it was... Well, then my uncle went into the garden and got his gun, but of course it wasn't there, and, and Scroggins said he didn't believe it. Didn't believe what? Who's Scroggins? Scroggins? But he, he was the other man, you know. Oh. It was his wife. What is his wife? <laughs> What's she got to do with it? I, that's what I'm telling you. Ah. It was she that found the hat. Oh, the she'd, hat. she'd come up with her cousin to London. Her cousin was my sister-in-law, and the other niece had married a man named Evans, and Evans, after it was all over, had taken the box round to Mr Jacobs because Jacobs' father had seen the man when he was alive. and no, he no, was... Never you mind Evans in the box. What's become of you? Your uncle and the gun. Yes. Yes. Gun? What gun? Oh. Gun he kept in the garden. Yeah. What did he do with it? If we killed anyone, we should enjoy hearing exactly. about it. Yeah, yeah, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. How could he? He had been bricked up alive in the wall, you know. <laughs> and when Edward the Fourth spoke to the abbot about it, my Edward sister said that in her state of health, <laughs> she could not uh, and would not, as it was endangering the child's life, Look here. ever oh, even... Yeah. Do you know what you're talking about? Uh, uh, no. Dear nephew, oh, for oh, the sake oh, of us all, oh, oh, pass me oh, the tea oh, towel. Oh, oh, tea towel. Oh, I do oh, know oh, that every oh, word oh, I say oh, is true, oh, because oh, I answer oh, it with your own eyes. Mr. Scrubbles continued his story under the tea towel for some time, whilst we imbibed another glass. No one paid him much attention. Though before he went to sleep, we caught a muttered reference to somebody discovering something or other. This put Mr. Coombs in mind of a very curious affair, which he proceeded to tell us about before anyone could stop him. He called it... The Old 
Potted milk. <coughs> now, I'm sure you all know my brother-in-law, Joe Parkins. Yes. We didn't know his brother-in-law, but we said we did, so as to save time. Uh, well, uh, he once took the lease of an old mill in Surrey, and it seems that years before, the place had been occupied by a wicked old miser who died there, leaving, it was rumoured, all his money hidden somewhere on the property. Wow. Uh, naturally enough, everyone who lived in the mill afterwards had tried to find the treasure, but without success. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the local wiseacre said that nobody ever would, unless the ghost of the miserly miller should one day take a fancy to one of the tenants and disclose the hiding place. Yes, yes. Uh, now, Joe didn't attach much importance to the story. He didn't see how a miller could very well have saved anything, <laughs> even if he was a miser. Yeah. Uh, he made no attempt to seek out the booty, and all proceeded normally in his new home until one night he went to bed. Well, there was nothing very extraordinary about that. Um, he often did go to bed at yeah. night. Oh, uh, what was remarkable, however, <clears throat> was that exactly as the clock of the village church chimed the last stroke of twelve, mm. he woke up with a start. Oh. He felt a presence. Oh. And there, at the foot of the bed, was a figure wrapped in shadow. Oh, it moved into the moonlight, and Joe saw it was a wizened old man in knee breeches. Oh. And a pigtail. It, it's the miser come to show me where his treasures is, thought Joe. And he resolved that he would not spend it all upon himself, but he would devote a modest percentage to good works. Yeah. The apparition moved hmm. towards the door. My brother-in-law put on his trousers and he followed it downstairs into the kitchen where it stood in front of the hearth, sighed yeah. and vanished. Next morning, Joe had a couple of bricklayers in to haul out the stove and pull down the chimney while he stood behind with a potato sack in which to put the gold. Oh, yeah. Well, they knocked down off the wall. I never found so much as a four-penny bit. Oh, yeah. The next night, the ghost appeared again and again led the way into the kitchen. This time, however, instead of going to the fireplace, it stood more in the middle of the room and sighed there. Oh, oh I see what he means now, said Joe. It's under the floor. Oh, Why oh, did yeah. the old idiot go and stand against the stove so as to make me think it was up the chimney? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they spent the next day taking up the kitchen floor, but the only thing they found was a three-pronged fork. And the handle of that was broken. <laughs> On the third night, yeah. the ghost reappeared, quite unabashed, and this time made for the kitchen ceiling. <laughs> well, Joe was the one to sigh this time. But next morning, down came the ceiling and the boards in the room above. No treasure to be found. Oh, oh, night yeah. after night, he followed the spectral old fraud about the house. Each night, a different place would be indicated, and the next day, Joe would break up another bit of mill. <laughs> After three weeks, there wasn't a room left fit to live in. <laughs> every wall had been pulled down, every floor taken up, every ceiling had a hole in it. God, yeah. Then, as suddenly as they'd begun, the ghost visit ceased, and Joe was left in peace to rebuild the place at his leisure. Uh, what could have induced the old image to play such a silly trick upon a family man and a ratepayer? Well, right. see if you can guess. For there is an answer. Uh, a trick got up by local residents, not a ghost at all. Uh, a close, but it was a ghost. Uh, yeah. The horrible truth was not apparent to Joe until he came to engage contractors to rebuild his devastated property. Uh -huh. On meeting the proprietor of the principal local building firm, he detected a certain familiar wizened look about him. Further investigation revealed that this man would be saved from bankruptcy by my brother-in-law's substantial building contract, and furthermore, he was the grandson of the wretched old miser. Oh, the, grandson. the ghost had been ensuring the prosperity of his descendants at Joe's expense. Oh, oh God. Dear. That's how Joe came to get bound over to keep the peace after using a chunk of masonry as an offensive weapon. <laughs> You're not surprised, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Joe Parkinson ah. is a party you don't meet with every day. Yeah. 
he's always ailing, Arty. Free and easy in his way. Quite so. You wouldn't call him handsome, but that isn't his disgrace. He looks as though a regiment had marched across his face. He's all right when you know him, but he's hasty when he's vexed. He'll black your eye one minute, and he'll stand you a pint the next. He wouldn't hurt a baby, he's a pal as you can trust. He's all right when you know him, but you've got to know him first. He's seen a deal of life as Joe. Although he's in his prime, he's had his bit of trouble and he's got his bit of time. Yeah. He'd never round upon a pal unless it filled his kick. But I've known him land a builder on the boat coat with a brick. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, jolly good. <laughs> oh, he's all right when you know him, but he's hasty when he's vexed. He'll black your eye one minute and he'll stand you a pipe the next. He wouldn't hurt a baby, he's a pal as you can trust. He's all right when you know him. But you've, you've got, got to him. know him first. Hey! Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I entirely approve of my brother-in-law being lampooned in salt. Oh. Then you obviously have not imbibed sufficiently, sir. Drink up all. Yes. Yes. Cheers. <laughs> no, no, your attention, please. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. I have decided as your host that it is incumbent on me to reciprocate the excellent storytelling of my guests with a tale of my own. Yes, scrubbles? I say scrubbles, old man. Uh, Our oh, host is to tell the next tale. Now oh, wake up! Tell Stiggy up, sir! Go back to sleep, my dear. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Coombs. I'm not sure that shaking the good curate will achieve any desirable effect. <laughs> Better than leave him tea toweled. <laughs> Sit down and listen. My tale is called The Ghost of the Blue Chamber and concerns this very house. Oh, yeah. I would not wish to make any of you nervous, but as a matter of fact, one of the bedrooms is haunted. You don't say that. What's the use of your saying I don't say it when I have just said it? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sure. Yes. As I say, this very house is haunted. Regularly on Christmas Eve, the Blue Chamber is haunted by the ghost of a sinful man. A man who once killed a carol singer with a lump of coal. A lump of coal? Was it difficult? I do not know how he did it. He did not explain the process. The Christmas wait had taken up a position just outside the front gate and was singing a ballad. It is presumed that when he opened his mouth for a B-flat... There you go. <coughs> was a bit flat. The lump of coal was thrown by the sinful man from one of the windows and that it went down the fellow's throat and choked him. Oh, he won a good shot, but it's certainly worth trying. But that was not his only crime, alas. Prior to that, he had killed a solo cornet player. No, oh, is that really a fact? Well, of course he's a fact. At all events, as much of a fact as you can expect to get in a case of this sort. How many capsules you are this evening? The poor cornet player had been in the neighbourhood barely a month. Old Mr. Bishop, who kept the Jolly Sandboys at the time, and from whom I had the story, said he had never known a more hard-working and energetic solo cornet player. Despite only knowing two tunes, Annie Laurie and Home Sweet Home, Mr. Bishop said that the man could not have played with more vigour or for more hours per day if he had known forty. Oh. This musician, <clears throat> this poor friendless artist, Thank you. Ah. Here's enough. Thank you. <clears throat> Used to play in this street just opposite for two hours each evening. One evening, evidently in response to an invitation, he was seen going into this very house, but was never seen coming out of it. Oh, was any reward offered for his recovery? No, I hate me. There is more. Another summer, a German band visited here, intending, so they announced, to stay until the autumn. On the day after their arrival, the entire company was invited to dinner by this sinful man, and after spending the whole of the next 24 hours in bed, left the town a broken and dyspeptic crew. <sighs> the doctor who attended them was of the opinion that they might never be fit to play an air again. <laughs> you don't know the recipe used, do you? Unfortunately not. 
though the chief ingredient was said to have been railway refreshment room pork pie. Oh. <laughs> this sinful man was not entirely unconnected with the death and subsequent burial of a man who played the harp with his toes. toes. <laughs> Nor was he altogether unresponsible for the lonely grave of an Italian barrel organist who strayed unwisely into this vicinity. Every Christmas Eve, the ghost of this wicked man haunts the blue chamber. From midnight until cockcrow, amid wild, muffled shrieks and groans, mocking laughter and the sound of horrid blows, it does fierce phantom fight with the spirits of the solo cornet player and the weight, assisted at intervals by the shades of the German band, while the strangled harpist plays mad melodies with ghostly toes on the shadow of a broken harp. Hark! Hark! I believe they are at it now. In the blue chamber. Now, as I stated at the beginning, there has been unpleasantness in our family over this party of ours, and in my share in the events I am about to relate. As a means of replacing my character in its proper light, of dispelling the clouds of calumny and misconception with which it has been darkened, I feel my best course is to give a simple and dignified account of the plain facts and allow the unprejudiced to judge for themselves. So... The assembled company, those of us who remain untetouled, that is, strained our ears for the sounds of ghostly music from the blue chamber and heard... Not a sausage. Mm. However, into this somewhat anticlimactic silence, I bravely stepped and announced to the assembled company, I will sleep in the blue chamber this very night. <gasps> Never! You shall not put yourself in this deadly peril. Besides, the bed's not me. Never mind the bed. I have lived in furnished apartments for gentlemen and have been accustomed to sleep on beds that have not been made from one year's end to the other. Do not thwart me in my resolve. I am young and have had a clear conscience now for over a month. The spirits will not harm me. I may even do them some little good and induce them to be quiet. Besides, I should like to see the show. And it is a guest's privilege to sleep in the haunted bedroom. Well, my boy, if you put it like that, I can hardly dissuade you. Take this candle to light your way, and jolly good luck. Here, here. Oh, I see. Very well. A brave fellow. I, I will pray for you. Oh, you're with us again, Scrubbles, old man. Oh, they all passed it. <laughs> Make haste to your nephew before your aunt removes the tea towel. Oh, oh, yes, 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 of course. Good luck. Well, good luck. Good, good luck, sir. Good luck. Hey, oh, good night. One last thing, Uncle. Yes. Why is it called the Blue Chamber? After the predominant colour of its toilet service, which you will find in the usual place under the bed should you need it. Good night, <laughs> dear boy. <laughs> good luck. Good Have a good, good night, night, sir. Uh, Teddy, at my exit music. At once, old chap. Oh, he is. <laughs> Climbing the stairs to a bedroom blue, this bold fellow has had a few, all unsuspecting of what will ensue. Oh, what a surprise! A spectre's a thing to beware of, it's true, especially when your bedchamber is blue. Just watch out, or he'll give to you. To Lovely black eyes, two lovely black eyes. Oh, what a surprise! Only for hunting for ghosts in the night. Two lovely black eyes. Next time ghosts are mentioned, it may be best to think very hard about where you'll rest. If a haunted room's mentioned, don't be pressed. For you'll have a surprise. It may be bunk or it may be true, but if you impress with your daring do, such ghostly encounters may give to you to a lovely black eye. Yes, to a lovely black eyes. Oh, what a surprise! Hunting for ghosts in the night. I need this candle out the gaslights. What's black?
Becker's pitch here. Now, left at the head of the stairs. We'll laugh about this in the morning. Ah, here we are. Hello? <laughs> As I thought. Well, Uncle John, it was a fine story and well told, but... Oh, dear. Ooh. I do believe the effects of your excellent punch will overcome my vigilance on Ghost Watch without the benefit of a tea towel. <laughs> oh. Oh. Good evening. Good Lord. My uncle's story had been true after all. There, sitting patiently at the end of my bed, was the spectral shape of an elderly male party smoking a pipe. Oh, good evening. I, I believe I have the honour of addressing the ghost of the gentleman who had the unfortunate accident with the Christmas weight. Mm, the incident is remembered, then. Oh, well, yes. In, in fact, we, well, maybe that is several guests of my aunt and uncle, who now own this house, which you probably know, so there's no need to tell you of it. We, we, we were given your story this evening. Ah. I, 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 I wonder. Yes. Just check a few of the facts of the case with you, if that's all right. It, it, is that all right? Yeah, get to the point. Oh, yes, right. Is it true that you had a hand in the death of an Italian battle organist? Had a hand oh, in it? Sorry. Who dared to pretend that he assisted me? I murdered the youth myself. Nobody helped me alone I did it. Show me the man that said I didn't. No, 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 no you, you misunderstand. Just a turn of phrase. No slur intended. Anything else? Oh, oh, well, yes. As a matter of fact, the solo cornet player. Which one? There was more than one. Not wishing to boast, there were seven, if one includes trombones. Oh, dear me. You must have had quite a busy time of it, one way or another. There are few who could look back on a life so full of sustained usefulness. Ah. Mm. You know, I never imagined a ghost smoking before. Oh, <laughs> a little indulgence. I used the ghost of best cut Cavendish as a rule, that being what I had in life. The ghost of all the tobacco that a man smoked in life belongs to him when he is dead. I am fortunate that I smoke so good a blend. Useful thing to know that. Must remember to smoke as much as possible before I die. Mind if I join you in a pipe? Do, do. And I will recount for you the nature of my crimes. Oh, <laughs> he had been an energetic old fellow in life. There were 18 muffin men that he had lured into passageways and stuffed with their own wares until they died. Young men and women who recited dreary poetry, he used to poison in batches of ten. Park orators and temperance lecturers, he used to shut up six in a room with a glass of water and a collection box apiece and let them talk each other to death. Oh, it did one good just to listen to him. Isn't it true, old fellow, that the ghosts of all your victims meet you here every Christmas Eve for a row? It was true. For 25 years we had the most wonderful get-togethers here. Ah, me. But no more. One by one I laid them out, spoilt and utterly useless for all haunting purposes. I finished off the last German bandsman just before you came upstairs. But I suppose you're still come yourself, as usual. Oh, I don't know. Nothing much to come for now. Unless, of course, you are going to be here. Oh, well, I, I, now, I, I, I've I, taken a liking to you. Oh, you don't fly off screeching when you see a party, and your hair doesn't stand on end. <laughs> yeah! No, I, 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 I say, you, you look quite ill. That, that was only an owl or some such. Afraid it was the cock. It's too early for that. It doesn't make any difference to those cursed chickens. They'd just as soon crow in the middle of the night if they thought it would spoil a chap's evening out. Friend of mine, ghost of a fellow who killed a water rate collector, used to haunt a house in Longacre where they kept fowls in the cellar. Every time a policeman went by and flashed his bullseye lantern down the grating, the old cock would crow like mad and my friend would have to dissolve. Damn bird! It does seem jolly unfair. It's an absurd arrangement altogether. I can't imagine what our old man was thinking of when he made it. As I've said to him over and over again, have a fixed time and let everyone stick to it. Then we'd all know where we were. Yeah. 
<laughs> there you are. That is the sort of thing we have to put up with. What is the time? It's half past three. Thought as much. Oh, well, if you can wait a minute, I'll go a bit of the way with you. Oh, it's very good of you, but it seems unkind to drag you out. Oh, no, not at all. We'll just step quietly down the stairs so as not to wake the rest of the house. Oh, sorry to pass through you. Oh, no, not at all. Well, I'll step quietly at least. You can float. Uh, I'll just see you at the corner. Ooh, oh, it's getting chilly. Ah, uh, good evening, Constable Jones. Morning, I should say, sir. <laughs> um, may I ask what you're to doing on? Mm, just seeing a friend part of the way home. Friend, sir? What friend? Uh, uh, of course, I forgot. He's invisible to you. Oh. He's the ghost of the gentleman that killed the Christmas wait, amongst others. Horns here regularly. Oh, no. Mrs. Bowles' cockerel stopped play, I'm afraid, so I'm seeing him off. Uh, just going to the caller with him. Well, I don't think I would if I were you, sir. If you take my advice, you'll say goodbye and go back indoors, oh, sir. I... <laughs> Perhaps you're not aware, sir, that you're walking about with nothing on but a nightshirt, a pair of boots and an opera hat. Where's your trousers? Uh, uh, Jones, I don't wish to report you, but it seems to me that you've been drinking. My trousers are where a man's trousers ought to be on his legs. I distinctly remember putting them on. Well, you haven't got them on now. I beg your pardon, I tell you I have. I think I ought to know. I think so too, sir, but you evidently don't. Now, come along indoors with me and don't let's have any more of it. Come, happy constable. Help! Good heavens, what is going on? He's not wearing any trousers. <laughs> My friend here can confirm. Oh, he's gone. Oh, get him off me, constable. Come along, sir. Help! Help! Perhaps I will be back in the blue chamber next year, after all. <laughs> I wish you a Merry Christmas. I wish you a Merry Christmas. I wish you a Merry Christmas. And good haunting next year. <laughs> I am indebted to my Uncle John for squaring it with the constabulary. But do you know, when I got back to my room and thought over events, I was so overcome with emotion at the sight of my trousers hanging over the bed rail that I burst into tears. I still find it affecting, even now. Such are the plain facts of the case, and I thank you for your indulgence in listening to them. I am sure that to your healthy, charitable minds, it must appear impossible that calumny should spring from such a tale. But it has. Persons, I say persons, have professed themselves unable to understand the simple circumstances I have disclosed to you, except in the light of explanations at once both misleading and insulting. Slurs have been cast and aspersions made on me by those of my own flesh and blood but I bear no ill feeling. I will state quite publicly and without rancor or regret that I wish all of those mentioned, even Aunt Maria, the most cordial seasonal felicitations. May my tale be a caution to those lucky enough to spend this season in the bosom of the family. Beware, at the first mention of ghosts, turn all the lights on full and earnestly discuss the weather. May your Christmas days be full of good cheer. I recommend whiskey punch. And your Christmas nights sweet and untroubled. Good night and a happy new year. In After Supper Ghost Stories by Jerome K. Jerome, Dinsdale Landon overindulged and lost his trousers. Geoffrey Matthews was Uncle John, Linda Poland, Aunt Maria, Roger Hammond, Mr. Coombs, Jonathan Taffler, Teddy Biffles, David Holt, Mr. Scrubbles, the ghost of a sinful man, John Baddeley, and the police constable, Philip Anthony. Musical accompaniment was provided on the pianoforte by Neil Brand. Jerome K. Jerome's After Supper Ghost Stories were adapted for radio by Paul Weatherby and directed by David Blount. Is this a musician I see before me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>